thanks for, for the introduction, for having me here uh, speak. So I thought what, what I'd do today is uh, talk about a few different things. So one thing uh, that I wanted to talk about first was to talk about uh, the benefits of living near nature, the benefits of nearby green space um, on health and, and self-control. Uh, to kind of set the stage for why um, this research is important. And then I'll talk about some theories as to why interacting with nature is beneficial. Um, in particular, I'll talk about um, a cognitive psychology theory um, that hypothesizes some mechanisms as to why interacting with nature is beneficial. And I'll talk about some uh, experimental studies that we conducted to test that theory. That was uh, one of the studies that Gene mentioned about a simple walk in a park improving um, attention scores by 20%. And then I'll move into some of the future research directions that we're taking a lot of this work. Where we're trying to figure out um, what it is about nature that's producing these benefits. Is it the fractalness of nature? Um, is it the sound of nature? Is there something special about the color green? Um, so I'll talk about how we're kind of deconstructing nature to sort of separate out the low level features of nature from the semantics of nature. Um, and then I'll close with some other future directions that we're taking this work. OK, so what are, what are some of the benefits of uh, neighborhood green space or uh, neighborhood natural spaces on health? Um, so we were very interested to see, does uh, neighborhood green space have some uh, independent impact on health uh, in a large urban center? So we looked at the city of Toronto. And our aim was basically to figure out to what extent does proximity to uh, green spaces um, relate to positive health outcomes. So is there some independent effect of green spaces on, on physical health and perceived health? So here's a map of Toronto. Uh, Toronto is broken up into these little kind of granular boxes called dissemination areas. So each one of these boxes has about 300 to 700 people. So you can think of them as like a census block. And the, so Toronto has 3,685 dissemination areas. We examined 3,202 of them. Those are the ones that are in tan. Um, those were the neighborhoods or dissemination areas that we had uh, green space data and health data. Okay, so we restricted our analysis to those areas. You can see that as you get into the core of Toronto, the dissemination areas get smaller because the population is more dense in those areas versus going out uh, into some neighborhoods further out from the core of Toronto. And we had two data sets to quantify green space. So here's one of the data sets. One of the data sets came from the QuickBird satellite. Um, and what it can do is basically at about six meter resolution, it can identify tree canopies uh, throughout the city. So what you're seeing here is the density of trees for these different dissemination areas of Toronto. And you can see there's a lot of variation. The areas in darker green have higher uh, tree canopy than the areas um, in lighter green. Okay, so there's some variability in terms of tree canopy in Toronto. Some neighborhoods have high tree density, other neighborhoods don't. We also had another data set to quantify uh, green space in these neighborhoods where people at the forestry uh, department at the University of Toronto went around the whole city of Toronto and cataloged every single tree on public land in the city of Toronto. <laughs> so what's being plotted here are all 580,000 trees on public land in the city of Toronto. So Toronto looks much greener than it actually is. If we take a little zoom in here, here's High Park in Toronto. So here's a little zoom in, here's High Park. And you can see all the tree-lined streets that are going into High Park, right? So these are basically all the trees that are on the easements, the, the land that separates sidewalk from the street. And we know two things about each tree. We know the species of the tree, and we know the diameter of the tree at breast height. And from those values, we can go look at forestry algorithms and calculate how much tree canopy each individual tree provides. So then with these two data sets, we can separate out green space in your neighborhood that's due to trees on the street or trees on public land versus trees in people's backyards. And we think that's important because the trees on the street 
um, we think may have a bigger impact because everyone sort of has access to those trees. The trees that are in uh, people's backyards or on private land, they may not be as accessible to everybody in the neighborhood. So we can also separate out um, the benefits from the street trees versus the trees in people's backyards. So one of the measures that, that we looked at, so we had data from the Ontario Health Study, which was an online survey that asked um, people a series of questions about their health, and we had 32,000 respondents. And one of the questions was, how healthy do you perceive yourself to be? And we found that a 1% increase in health perception was associated with having 10 more trees of average size per city block. So that seems pretty modest. But to get those equivalent benefits with money, you'd have to give every household in that city block about $10,000 and have them all move to a neighborhood that has a median income that's $10,000 wealthier or make people seven years younger. Okay? So this 1% increase seems pretty modest, but when you compare it um, to these other manipulations, it, it looks pretty powerful. And I want to stress one thing, too, that these are all independent effects where we control for the other variables. So this is 10 more trees on the street controlling for age, education, and income. This is $10,000 controlling for trees, age, and education. This is seven years younger. Uh, controlling for trees, income, and education. So these are all independent effects. It's definitely the case that uh, wealthier neighborhoods have more tree density. The correlation in Toronto was about 0.4, so about 20% of the variance um, in tree canopy is due to wealth, but 80% is not accounted for, right? Um, so we thought this was a pretty interesting effect that the trees seem to be having um, this somewhat uh, independent effect on health. Sorry, is this adjusted for the point you just made? That trees are, so this is after you take the moon from the well plane. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Any sort of trend in, is so health perception is self-reported? Yes. Was there any sort of socioeconomic trend on health perception, did you see? Uh, yeah, so the increase of $10,000 was also associated with increased health perception. Yeah. 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 So all of these things will increase your health perception by 1% or are correlated with increases in health perception of 1%. If we look at more uh, objective measures of health, so in this case, uh, metabolic disorders, so this included stroke, uh, diabetes, and heart disease, we found that a 1% decrease in uh, metabolic disorders was associated with um, having 11 trees of average size per city block or uh, giving every household in that city block about $20,000 and having them all move to a neighborhood with a median income that was about $20,000 wealthier or uh, being about one and a half years younger. So it's not just health perception, it's also this more objective measure of health. Two, two caveats, so we can't say that the trees are causing better health, right? This is a purely correlational data. Um, so the bad case scenario is just healthier people choose to live in neighborhoods that are greener, right? But in this study, those people can't be younger, they can't be more educated, and they can't be wealthier. So. You know, I'm pretty confident in the direction, but we certainly can't, can't claim any kind of causality here. Also, the study was done in Ontario that has socialized health care. So this dollar amount might actually be a little bit inflated because maybe one dollar in Canada isn't as tied to your health because everybody more or less gets the same health care. So we want to do basically the same analysis in the United States to see do we get similar values, or does, does this income value actually decrease a little bit? OK, so any questions on this? Yeah. Why did we choose Toronto? Why did we choose Toronto? Um, well, it was, it was convenient. Uh, so I was doing my postdoc in Toronto at the time. Um, I had a researcher there who had access to this big health database. And Toronto had that really unique data set with the individual trees. So we don't have this for Chicago. Um, we do have something pretty cool for Chicago, though. 
what we have for Chicago is LIDAR data. LIDAR data is when an airplane flies over an area, shines a laser, basically, on the area, and then you can map the shapes of uh, different um, structures on the ground. So we have LIDAR data for the city of Chicago, and we can identify individual trees, the shape of individual trees, and things like that. We don't know the species of the tree. We don't know the heights of the trees. Um, but it's a pretty similar kind of data set. Yeah. And it was also good, too, in Toronto to actually have socialized health care, that that variable wasn't really playing a role. Um, but I think now we're kind of in a good position to look um, in the U.S. where we don't, we don't actually have that. Yeah. So if you're going here, just don't answer this. But I guess I'm stuck with this conceptual question of why, why you think there's a relationship between yeah. trees and houses. So I don't yeah. know if you're going there, then just don't answer it. No, I think this is a good time to talk about that. So um, we don't know the mechanism here. We have some ideas. So one idea that we have has to do with air quality. Um, and it was kind of interesting that, I didn't mention this, but the trees on the street had a bigger impact than the trees in people's backyard. So maybe is that due to um, their ability to sort of rid the air of pollutants if they're closer to the roads where presumably a lot of the air pollution come from? So that's one thing that we're wondering about. Another mechanism is that we think that having trees or green space encourages exercise. So we think that potentially people who live in neighborhoods um, that, ha that are greener might exercise more. We also think that there may be an aesthetic to nature that might be producing these benefits. And what is kind of leading us in that direction is a study that was done by Roger Ulrich in the 1980s um, in hospitals. So he looked at recovery time from gallbladder surgery uh, in hospitals, and he had a couple different hospital rooms that he was studying. And some of the hospital rooms had views of nature, like a view of some trees outside. And some of the hospital rooms had views of just like a brick wall. And basically, and they were all on the same corridor of the hospital. And basically what he was interested in looking at is does the view out of your hospital room window impact recovery from gallbladder surgery? And what he found is that the people who had a view of nature out of their window recovered from gallbladder surgery about a day faster, and they used less analgesics, they used less pain medication if they had a view of nature out their window versus a view of just a built kind of space. So it's unlikely that this was due to air quality. It's unlikely that this is due to exercise. It's likely that this is due to some kind of aesthetic to nature, maybe nature sounds or something like that. So there's something about perceiving the features of nature that might also be uh, leading to these benefits. Yeah, sure. It could just be it could just be a preference, right? So maybe if there was a nice piece of artwork uh, there, maybe that would have a similar effect. Yep. Maybe, maybe the staff that found those rooms were pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Right. So then, but why do the staff why do the staff like it more, right? So then we get back to the same same problem. But yeah, sure, could be, right? And. I would bet a lot of money that this is a pretty implicit effect. So I doubt that the people that have the modest nature view are staring out the window all day long, and the people that have the view of the brick wall aren't. Um, so my hunch is that these are pretty implicit effects. And um, some interesting studies that are sort of related to this, looking at views of nature, uh, were some studies done by Francis Quo and Bill Sullivan at the University of Illinois, where they were looking at public housing projects in Chicago. So here are the, the Robert Taylor homes uh, in Chicago. And you know I don't have to tell you, but these are not the greatest places to live. Um, you know, high crime rates, high uh, drug use, negative effects on children that lived in these public housing projects. And what Quo and Sullivan did um, was they looked at the views from different windows of the apartments in these Robert Taylor public housing uh, projects, and they studied um, 169 child guardian pairs to see if there are any effects on the view uh, from the windows of these public housing projects on any psychological variables in the adults and also in the children. 
So here's an example of a poor uh, nature view out of the, the window from these Robert Taylor homes. Here's an example of a good nature view. And you can see it's pretty modest. Um, you know, certainly it's different, but it's not like this view is tremendous uh, and this view is horrible. Um, but these kind of modest uh, changes, they found that the kids who lived in the apartments that had the modest views of nature, they scored better on, mem on memory and attention tasks such as the backwards digit span task. So that's a task where you hear digits out loud, uh, like five, six, seven, and you need to repeat the digits back in backwards order, so seven, six, five. At three digits, the task is really easy, but you increase all the way up to about 11 digits. The task gets really hard. It gets really hard, actually, at about five digits. Um, and so what they found is that the kids that had the modest view of nature uh, scored better on these backward digit span tasks than the kids that, that didn't, that had the sort of non-nature view. Uh, in addition, the kids that had the modest nature views, they also had better uh, impulse inhibition, which is measured by a Stroop task, uh, and they had better delay gratification, which is a measure of self-control. So these kids that had the modest nature views, they had better attention and better self-control. Interestingly, these families are all randomly assigned to these different apartments. So it's not like families that are a little bit wealthier get the nature view um, and less wealthy families get the non-nature view. That's not the case. It's also not the case that people know what kind of view they have. So again, it's not the case that the people that have the nature view are staring out the window all day long or talking about this great view that they have. Uh, these are very, very implicit kinds of effects but seem to be having um, some significant impacts. Okay, well what about, what about the adults? So here's um, a study they did in the Ida Wells public housing facility. Uh, so here's an example of a poor nature view from the Ida Wells public housing facility in Chicago. Uh, here's an example of a good nature view. And here they were looking at reported crimes. So how many reported crimes are there, are there uh, for different levels of vegetation that surround the public housing project? And what they find is a linear decrease. So if you have more vegetation, more green space around the public housing project, there are less reported crimes in those public housing projects. So more green space, less crime. And they were very interested to see why is this the case? So why would having uh, green space around the public housing project contribute to better uh, self-control and less crime. So again, they went back to the Ida Wells, I mean to the uh, Robert Taylor home. So here's a poor nature view, here's a good nature view. And what they did this time is that they measured uh, aggression levels and they found that with better nature views there was less reported uh, aggression and that these aggression uh, improvements were mediated by attention improvements. So if you give people, these adults, that backwards digit span task, which is very taxing of attention, of working memory, of concentration, um, they found that those improvements mediated the improvements in aggression. So what they think was happening is that with nature out of your window, you have better attention which then allows you um, to control your behavior more. And I think we've all kind of had this sensation that when we're tired or mentally fatigued, you're more irritable um, and sort of less able to control your behavior. And so what they think is going on is something similar here, that nature might be um, improving attention, which then might be able to sort of control our impulses. Okay? that this is one potential mechanism. And when I talk about attention restoration theory, I'm going to focus more on this kind of mechanism. Okay? Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and we've done that too. Um, we haven't looked at nature per se um, with broken windows, but there is an interesting paradox. So. We find that nature is good. We find that disorder tends to be bad. But if you ask people to rate how disorderly nature is, they rate nature to be more disorderly than urban environments. 
So there's a little bit of this paradox. And what we find is that essentially nature trumps disorder. That, that nature, even though it's rated as being disorderly, trumps any negative effects of disorder. To go even further, this is a little bit a divergence from the rest of what I'm going to talk about, but one thing that we've done with broken windows theory is we've separated out social cues of disorder from, from visual disorder. So what I mean by that is let's say, um, I don't know if you all can see this, but if I've got a building here, and uh, you know, I'm a really bad drawer, but I'm going to put some graffiti on the building, okay? The graffiti on the building signals that, hey, a rule's been broken. You're not allowed um, to you know, put graffiti on this building. But it's also visually disordered, right? It's kind of scrambled. So what we've done is we've created these nonsense images that are just like scrambles versus images that are kind of more orderly. And we find that people are much more likely to cheat if they've been exposed to images like this versus images like this. And it's not clear that there's any social cue here to disorder that's producing those effects. So there's something about seeing things that maybe are sort of visually hard to process that might rob you of self-control resources that then might make you more likely to cheat. But yeah, so you know, we don't know if a tree signals something like higher morality or something like that, and that um, that might be related to benefits. Could, it's possible. Uh, but we know for broken windows kinds of things that it's not necessarily just a social cue that's a problem. It's also how visually disordered um, the environment is. Something perceptual might be at play as well. Okay, so. Um, I hope I prevented, uh, presented some research to show that modest tweaks to the environment can have a positive impact on a diverse set of problems, but I really want to strongly suggest that I'm not saying that nature is going to solve all of these problems. These are very, very complicated problems. So, you know, if we plant a bunch of trees and sing Kumbaya, you know, we're not, we're not going to solve all these problems. However, the a major takeaway that, I, that I'd like you to have is that the physical environment that we live in can have a really significant impact on our behavior. Okay, so changes to the physical environment can strongly impact our behavior. And I think humans tend to ignore that a lot because we have so much control over the physical environment. But we haven't really designed the physical environment to improve people's behavior. We've designed the physical environment to move goods efficiently, to move people efficiently, to house people efficiently. We haven't really designed the environment um, to improve people's attention or to improve people's self-control. Okay. So why, why do we think um, that interacting with nature is beneficial? So I'll talk about uh, a couple of different theories, but I'm gonna focus on this attention restoration theory um, so attention restoration theory is a, is a cognitive theory uh, as to why interacting with nature is beneficial, but there are a number of other theories. I know many of you uh, might have heard of the biophilia hypothesis uh, that was presented by E.O. Wilson and Stephen Kellert, uh, which basically states that humans have this sort of innate love for nature. You know, we evolved in nature, and now in modern times, we've sort of distanced ourselves um, from the natural world, and that if we can engage more with nature, we're sort of engaging more with some of our primal uh, desires, and that's why interacting with nature is beneficial. Other people posit that interacting with nature might reduce stress levels, and that could be producing the benefits. Um, and honestly, you know, all of these things could be at play, but I'm going to focus mostly on this attention restoration theory. Okay. So one of the, the main tenets of attention restoration theory uh, is that humans have two kind of modes of attention, two main modes of attention. So one being top-down directed attention or sometimes referred to as voluntary attention or endogenous attention. And that's the kind of attention that you use a lot at work 
or that you're using right now. So presumably you're deciding to focus your attention on me even though I might not be the most interesting stimulation in the environment. Okay, there are, you could definitely probably think about more interesting things than what I'm talking about. You could be staring outside, there might be more interesting things outside, but presumably you've decided to focus your attention on me and to what I'm saying. And it's thought that that kind of attention is finite and can be depleted. Okay? So really boring lecturers are really hard to pay attention to, right? Because they tax your ability to direct attention. It's not easy. You have to keep trying really hard to focus your attention on, on the boring lecture. Or we've all had the feeling at around 3.30 or 4 o'clock after a long day at work where you're kind of staring at the computer screen and saying, boy, I cannot concentrate anymore. You know, that's what we call directed attention fatigue, and that's a good time to take a walk in nature. That's a good time to take a break. It's not a good time to respond to email. It's not a good time to watch television. It's a, it's a good time to take a walk in nature. We think that's different from another form of attention called involuntary attention, or sometimes referred to as bottom-up or exogenous attention, and that's the kind of attention that's automatically captured by interesting stimulation in the environment. So if there was a loud noise outside right now, you all would automatically orient your attention to that window and you wouldn't have any control over it, okay? Bright lights, loud noises, those things automatically capture attention. Very interesting things automatically capture your attention and you don't really have a lot of control over it. And also we think that this kind of attention is less susceptible to depletion or fatigue. So you don't often hear people say, wow, I can't stand looking at that beautiful waterfall anymore. It's just too interesting. Um, I'm getting really tired looking at it. Or, oh, I can't stand uh, watching that really interesting uh, show on TV. It's just too interesting. You know, I'm, I'm getting really tired out. Um, so what we think is, if you can find environments that are rich with interesting stimulation to sort of activate this involuntary attention while simultaneously not placing demands on directed attention, that you might be able to restore or replenish this, this precious directed attention resource. And we think that nature is one example of such an environment, but it may not be the only example. Maybe walking uh, through the field museum might do the same kind of thing, as long as you don't have to be tested later on, on the artifacts. Maybe going to the symphony might, might be similar, right? So we think any kind of environment that sort of has interesting stimulation to capture this involuntary attention while not placing demands on directed attention would lead to some restoration of these directed attention resources. And we think that natural environments um, that most of us encounter on a daily basis is a good example. Okay, so, if, so, um, so, so another concept that I think is important to talk about too is this idea of soft fascination. So we think that the way that the stimulation captures your attention should be soft and not all consuming. So when I'm looking at that interesting waterfall, it captures my attention, but I can still think about other things. I can still daydream, I can still mind wander. It's not capturing all of my attentional resources. If I'm walking through Times Square or I'm watching this really interesting movie, usually those kinds of things capture all of your attentional resources and you can't really mind wander or think about other things. So we think that the kind of stimulation in the environment that's capturing your attention needs to be softly fascinating and not, and not a harsh kind of attentional capture. Yeah. Where would you think something like meditation Yeah, meditation is tricky. So people find uh, meditation effects that are similar to being in nature. But depending on the kind of meditation, I'm not sure that it's softly fascinating. So a lot of times it takes a lot of training um, to get there. So in some sense, I think med meditation definitely works, but I think the mechanism might be a little bit different. And in fact, I think a lot of people like to meditate in beautiful nature, maybe because it makes it easier to do the hard work that's involved in meditation. So 
It's actually related to something that was getting tripped up out of my head when you were in the last slide. And that is, it seems like you were equating the context, like nature, with involuntary and other contexts with voluntary, but I actually don't think they would, like you could be, you could be studying a waterfall. Mm -hmm. That's very directed. Right. And I wouldn't want to study the waterfall yes. for five hours. Right. And you can be in, a, in Times Square and have Times Square and not really paying attention to your surroundings. And some people might find that actually yep. good background noise to focus on something. So I, I think there's a potential compound between Yeah, those two. I definitely agree with you in the waterfall example. I don't agree with you so much in the Times Square example because you have to be pretty vigilant in Times Square. Um, but yeah, context matters a lot. And <laughs> so not all natural environments are created equal. Not all urban environments are created equal. I had um, this guy contact me. His name is Nelson Dellis. He's, a, he's one of these memory champion guys. So if you give him a deck of 52 cards and you randomize it, he can memorize the order of the cards in about a minute. And this guy happens to be an avid rock climber. And he called me up and he said, Mark, I was reading about attention restoration theory. And um, I was summoning Mount Everest. And I was finding that as I was getting higher in altitude, my memory was improving. You know, is that because of soft fascination and attention restoration theory? And I said, no. <laughs> because you're using so much directed attention to climb that mountain, that's got to be a different kind of mechanism. So if you're walking in nature and you don't feel safe, you're not going to get any benefit. Um, if you're walking in nature and you're talking on the cell phone and you're not really paying attention to the environment, you're not going to get the benefit either. So we're talking about these kind of passive engagements with the environment where you're not using directed attention. Um, but, that, but it's a good question. So. You know, if you're walking in an urban environment where you don't have to be crossing a lot of streets and there are interesting storefronts to look at, that might that might work too. Yeah. So kind of going off that, if you were imagine two stressful phone calls, one of them you're like pacing back and forth in the ugly hallway, and one of them you're like walking up and down a tree lined street, wouldn't your research kind of say maybe at the end of the one where you're walking up and down a tree lined street, you might be in a better place than the one where you're in the hallway? Absolutely. But you're not getting the full benefit if you weren't engaged with the conversation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So how did we, how did we test this? Um, so one of the first ways that we tested this uh, was a study that we did on college students uh, at the University of Michigan. So we had 38 participants. We tested them on that really hard backwards digit span task to measure their directed attention performance. Um, we measured their mood. Then we also fatigued participants uh, before they either went on a walk in nature or a walk in an urban environment um, with a really difficult working memory task to kind of get them in a directed attention fatigue state. And then we either sent them on a walk in nature or a walk in an urban environment. So here's, here's the two walks. So here's East Hall where the psychology department is at the University of Michigan. So here the walk in green, this is a satellite image of the two walks, the walk in green is the walk through the Ann Arbor Arboretum. The walk in red is the walk through busy Huron Street uh, and Washtenaw uh, in Ann Arbor. Both walks were equal distance. They were 2.6 miles. It took participants about 50 minutes to complete each walk. So you're a participant in the study. You come to the lab. We assess your memory, your attention, your mood. You either go for the walk in nature or you go for the walk in the urban environment. You come back to the lab. We assess your memory and attention again and your mood again. You come back to the lab a week later and you repeat the whole procedure. If you walked in nature the first week, you walk in the urban environment the second week or vice versa. We did two important things. The first thing we did is we kept uh, the student's cell phones in the lab. Okay? So we're not going to let you chit chat on the walks. You're going to have to be engaged with the walks. We also gave every participant a GPS watch so that you couldn't, you couldn't go to the coffee shop. You had to go on the walk so we knew what you did. Um, and we also gave participants a map of both walks to make sure that the walks were more or less um, equated in distance. And to address the question before about, you know, 
is this something special about nature per se? We, we did make this urban walk not really pleasant. And what I mean by that, this was, you know, by Ann Arbor standards, this was pretty heavy traffic. There weren't any real storefronts here. Um, and you had to be really vigilant. When we were piloting the study before and we allowed people to walk on State Street or Main Street that are kind of nicer streets in Ann Arbor, we weren't finding as large of an effect. So we purposely did not sort of allow people to engage in involuntary attention on the urban walk and require them to use a lot of directed attention. So what did the results look like? Well, we found that participants improved by about a digit and a half um, on this backwards digit span task after walking in nature versus the urban environment. Um, and the interaction is significant. So they significantly improved uh, their performance after walking in nature over and above any benefit that they got from walking in the urban environment. So everybody improves a little bit um, just by doing the same task twice, but you show this much larger boost after walking in the urban environment versus the, I mean, after walking in the nature environment versus the urban environment. Okay. Were there any order effects? So did it matter if you walked in nature the first week or the second week? And in this study, we didn't find any order effects. But now in a meta-analysis where we're analyzing lots and lots of studies, we are finding an order effect that the effects appear to be stronger in the second session. So after we sort of remove the practice effects, you continue to get better after you walk in nature, but you don't get any better if you walk in the urban environment the second week. We don't find any relationships to mood, so we do find that people's mood tends to improve after walking in nature. People like the nature walk better than the urban walk. We don't find any correlation between the improvements in mood and the improvements on backward digit span. And, and even, so it's not, we don't think we're getting these benefits simply because this is a nice stimulus and it's putting you in a better mood. Something else seems to be happening. And an even stronger demonstration of that is that we had people walk at different times of the year. So we had people walk in June, 75, 80 degrees Fahrenheit in Ann Arbor. People go out on the walk and say, wow, I love this. I can't believe I'm getting paid to go for a walk. Um, you know, really big mood improvements, uh, big backwards digit span improvements. We had people walk in January, 25 degrees Fahrenheit. People said, Mark, why'd you make me go out there? I was freezing my butt off. I really hated the walk. Um, but you showed the same memory and attention benefit in January as you did in June. So you don't even have to enjoy the walk, per se, to get the cognitive benefit, okay? And we think that's, that's pretty important. So the improvements in mood seem to be separate from the cognitive improvements. We did a very similar uh, experiment, but this time we had people view pictures of nature versus pictures of urban scenes. And we found some similar changes in backwards digit span. They weren't as strong as the actual walks. Um, and we also found some improvements in a different uh, kind of attention task called the attention network task. Um, and the, the effects appeared to be specific to this directed attention, to this top-down attention. You weren't improving on all different kinds of attention um, on this task. So interacting with nature, you can get the benefits even from pictures. The effects aren't as strong as the actual walks, uh, but you can get some similar benefits, suggesting that there's something about the visual organization of nature that might be leading to some of these benefits. And we've done a very similar thing with sound. So we've done another study where we have people listen to nature sounds versus urban sounds, look at nature pictures versus urban pictures. So here's the design. So we assess people's mood. We give them this backwards digit span task. Oh, we give them a really, another kind of nasty task. This is called a dual end back task. You're tracking the position of a square on the screen, and you need to say whether the position of the current square matches the one either two trials back or three trials back. While simultaneously you've got headphones on and you're hearing a series of letters, and you need to say whether the current letter matches the one you heard two trials back or three trials back. It's really, really hard. It's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm usually separate. I usually try to stay away from the lab when we run this. Um, 
So we've got them, the, we have them do this backward digits band task, this dual n-back task, and then we break participants up into four different conditions. They either hear nature sounds, they see nature pictures, they listen to urban sounds, or they see urban pictures. Again, we assess their mood, backward digits band performance, dual n-back performance, and we find a very similar thing. So we, we actually built a composite score between uh, backwards digit span and this dual n back task. So, so scores here indicate you, um, higher scores here indicate better performance on backwards digit span and the dual n back task. And you can see that participants improve significantly um, after listening to nature sounds or seeing nature pictures versus listening to urban sounds or seeing urban pictures. Do you have one of like just sounds, like of urban and nature versus just pictures? Like, what's the difference in effect for sound versus sight? So this is these are just so th this is just sound. This is just pictures. This is just sound, just pictures. So here they're but the graph. Is the graph we combined it because we didn't see any differences between okay. sound and pictures. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Really, do you try to? Um, I know I'm stuck on this issue, sorry. But yes. do you try to um, equate mm -hmm. the quality of the mm -hmm. two environments? Because mm -hmm. I'm still stuck on, yeah. I'm not convinced it's nature, it's just something. That you like. Yeah, so, um, so there's two things there too. We're trying to, it's not easy. People have a very strong preference for nature. So what we have to do, what we're starting to do now is we build categories. We have super pretty nature. We have pretty nature, and we have ugly nature, and we match. We can't find any urban that matches super pretty nature. So we have super pretty urban that has the same preference as pretty nature. We've got kind of neutral urban that matches with ugly nature, and then we've got super ugly urban. <laughs> beautiful architecture. I was in Brasilia. Yeah. Brasilia is ugly from a nature standpoint, but there's beautiful architecture. Yep. Yeah. Or like Zen, like a Japanese Zen garden. garden yeah. That mm -hmm. aren't very nature. Yeah. So it's funny that you're giving examples of built environments that mimic a lot of natural patterns, which is another thing that we've been looking at. So I'm working with an architect, and and there's this architect Christopher Alexander who has some theories about mimicking the patterns of nature in built environments that people will find very attractive. And it turns out we've done a study now where we're, it's all buildings but they vary in design features that mimic nature, fractalness, or you can imagine, you know, Gaudi's buildings in Barcelona, right? And people prefer those buildings over the more modernist, kind of blocky architecture. Now the question is, do people get these cognitive benefits from seeing those buildings versus um, the more modernist ones? We don't know that yet, but it's something that we're very interested in. But even if it is preference, it's interesting because it's not mood. So you, you might like it a lot, but it's not really moving the needle on improvements in mood. So, you know, what is it about seeing something you like that would be leading to the benefits, even if it's not changing your sort of effective state? It's a little bit complicated. It's a little bit complicated. Yep. Did you look at all for the sights and sounds about where students were from? What they from? Yeah, it's a really good question. We didn't get a lot of variance there. So one thing that I think is a little bit of a problem with the Ann Arbor study that we did is that many of the students weren't familiar with the Ann Arbor Arboretum. So they were kind of like dumbfounded. Wow, there's this really cool space that I've never been to before. So maybe there was a little bit of a novelty effect that we put them in this more novel environment versus less novel environment. Um, but we don't know. Like if you're more of an urbanite versus a rural person, would that modulate the effect? We're not sure. But the fact that you don't have to like the interaction to get the cognitive benefit suggests to us that your preferences might not always be telling, but we don't know that directly. So it's a really interesting question. And for example, too, maybe if there's something about novelty, maybe if you grew up in more rural areas, maybe the city has this kind of novelty to it that would lead to some kind of benefit. Yeah. But it would also presumably require a lot of directed attention. So we'd have to figure out a way to kind of get, get that out. OK, so we find some similar effects um, with sounds. And presumably, 
maybe that's why the actual walks are better because you're combining all these modalities together, right? So vision and audition yield similar benefits. You combine them together, maybe you get this added, added benefit. So uh, what I hope I've showed you is that brief interactions with nature led to a 20% improvement in working memory span, a measure of directed attention. Um, the effects seem not to be driven by mood or time of the year. We get similar effects um, with pictures. Um, suggesting maybe there's something uh, visual about the stimuli. We also get similar effects with sound. So there's something maybe about the acoustic profiles of nature sounds that leads to these benefits. Um, the effects appear to be specific to directed attention, to this kind of top-down kind of attention. And I didn't show you the study, but we did a, a study where we had participants who had been diagnosed with uh, major depression and the effects for them were actually five times larger than the effects in our non-clinical sample. So initially when we did this study with participants who had been diagnosed with major depression, we weren't really sure the direction of the results. We thought maybe um, in, if you're in this depressive state and we send you on a walk alone, maybe that's going to increase rumination and you're not going to get the benefit of the environment. But we're finding actually just the opposite. The effects appear to be stronger uh, for participants who have been diagnosed with major depression. Yeah. Yeah. So the the distance was the same. The ARB walk had more up and down, so it might be more cardiovascularly challenging. Um, but the fact that you get it with the pictures suggests that it's not just about the exercise, or that you get it with the sound um, suggests that it's not about the exercise. But they're maybe there are some interactions between exercising in one kind of environment versus another. Yeah. Actually, too, with the individuals with depression, usually we've interpreted these results as a benefit to nature and kind of a neutral um, or kind of no, no change with urban. For this group, we actually saw worsened performance after walking in the urban environment. So that's something else we've been kind of thinking about is the directionality of the effects. Like, is, is nature really improving or is urban kind of fatiguing you? Um, so we need to have other kinds of control conditions to look at the directionality. We've, we've um, so the initial studies we focused more on kind of forest and trees. Um, now when we have larger picture sets, we've been looking at deserts and mountains and lakes and um, to see are there any kind of differences for these different kinds of environments. And we don't know the answer to that yet, but it's a really important question. Um, we're also kind of wondering too, are there cultural differences. So in North America, we have kind of one conception of nature that other um, cultures may not have. Um, so that's something else we've been kind of playing around with too. So it's a really good question. We, we, most of these studies have focused sort of North American forest kinds of nature. Um, but uh, looking at blue space and other kinds of environments is something we're kind of interested in looking at too. Did you have a question back there? No. Yeah. What, how are you distinguishing between pictures and visual depictions? Um, I'm not here. Yeah, so I, I should have just wrote pictures again. Yeah, yeah, I should have just wrote pictures again. Do you have the, one thing, most of the people that are the subjects in this experiment are pretty urban people. If you did an experiment where you say, had you know, ranchers or people who just yeah. had a different tactile mm -hmm. experience with nature yeah. all the time, would there be anything that you would expect to be different? Yeah, um, I get that question sometimes too. So if nature isn't a signal for respite, but it's actually a signal for work, um, would you get similar kinds of effects? And I think the short answer is we don't know. Um, but I do think it matters what you're doing in the environment. So if we take a botanist, and if they're out in the field identifying you know, different plants, I don't think that's going to be very restorative. If they're out there in a walk in nature and they can prevent themselves from identifying all the plants, I think it would be restorative. If the rancher can kind of just relax in the environment, 
Um, I think they would still get the same benefit, but it's, it's an open question, right? And it kind of gets back to this novelty idea, too, is it either nature per se or a, or a novel kind of environment. So, so in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to talk about um, some kind of future directions that we're taking this work and how we're sort of deconstructing nature. Um, so we, we, we want to kind of develop, develop a taxonomy of features that differentiate natural from urban scenes. And maybe these features that differentiate natural from urban scenes uh, might be related to why interacting with nature is beneficial. So for example, the amount of fractalness in a scene um, strongly distinguishes most nature scenes from urban scenes. Is it just about seeing fractalness that might be related to these benefits? So we want to find features that distinguish uh, the environments to see if those features on their own uh, might be producing some of the benefits. So here's, here's what we do. So here's a scene that's got mixed uh, natural and urban content. And we can calculate the brightness of every pixel in the scene, the color saturation of each pixel in the scene, the hue of each pixel in the scene, and we can calculate the standard deviation of all those properties. We can quantify the amount of entropy in the scene. So that's uh, thought to be the amount of information that's in the scene. So grayscale entropy, we grayscale the images, and then we say, OK, if you know one pixel's value in the image, how easily can you predict the other pixel's values? And it turns out that natural images tend to have higher entropy or higher information than urban scenes. So in this scene here, if you know one pixel's value, you can more easily predict the other pixel's values because there's more redundancy. In this nature scene, there's less redundancy, there's more information, there's higher entropy. We can also quantify with computer vision algorithms the amount of curved edges and straight edges in the scene. So here, I'm plotting all the edges in the scene, the curved edges and the straight edges. Here, I'm just plotting all the, all the straight lines in the scene. And then what we do is we have hundreds of people rate hundreds of these scenes for how natural they think the scene is, how much do they like the scene, how orderly do they think the scene is. And then we train a machine learning algorithm based on these low level features to see if we can predict people's um, naturalness ratings based on these features. Or can we predict people's preferences based on these features? And it turns out we can with really high accuracy. So with about 80 to 90% accuracy, we can predict how natural you'll think a scene is based only on uh, the amount of curved lines, the color properties, um, and things like that. So for example, here, the amount of curved edges, non-straight edges is highly predictive of naturalness rating. The amount of straight lines uh, negatively predicts, meaning that it's more predictive of urban scene. So this isn't too surprising. Uh, but what it tells us is that people are using more or less the same features in coming up with these naturalness judgments. So, so the question is, is if, if we just show you images that have curved edges that are just nonsense, will you get any benefit? Something that we're looking into. Same thing with preference. So I won't go into all the details here, but basically we can explain 50% of the variance in people's preferences for these images based only on these low-level visual features. Um, so people like, they like these curved edges. They like the sort of entropy levels that are contained in nature. And we're doing the same thing with sound. So we're decomposing sounds into their low level um, visual features and predicting how natural people think different sounds are, uh, how much they like different sounds, how disorderly they think different sounds are from the low level acoustic features that are contained in the sound. Um, and we find, for example, um, so one thing that's very predictive of naturalness ratings is this thing called spectral centroid, which you can think of as um, the dominant sort of frequencies in the sound. And we find that sounds that have higher spectral centroids are rated as being more natural even when we generate the sounds that have no semantic content. So if I play you this sound here, mm -hmm. 
play you this sound here. Okay. People rate the first sound as being more natural than the second sound. And if we have people write labels for what they sound, what they think the sound is, people are more likely to write things like bird song or water for this sound. And for this sound, they're more likely to write, you know, vehicle or um, car horn or something like that. And these sounds, we just can, we just generate them on a computer. So there's something causal about these low-level acoustic features on causing people to think about nature or causing people to think about urban. Now the question is, if we play you those kind of sounds, do you improve your working memory performance? Right? That's something that we're interested in looking in, into. And the same thing with vision. So if we show you this kind of image here where we scrambled a nature scene, so it's got all the edge content of the nature scene, versus this urban scene, if we show you a series of these kinds of images, would you show improvements in backwards digit span uh, compared to a series of these images? Yeah? Um, in tracking how smell is detected? We haven't looked at that modality, although <laughs> I had a really kind of funny conversation with Jack Gilbert. I don't know if you guys know Jack Gilbert. He's a big microbiome guy here. And he was talking about smell. And he wanted to do an experiment where we put people in an MRI machine to monitor brain activity, we would puff nature smells at them. We would puff the microbiome of nature without any smells. We would puff urban smells without any microbiome of urban or urban micro bacteria without the smells to see if it's the bacteria or the smells. We didn't end up doing that, but we have started to think about smells too. And you know, presumably, yeah, maybe there's something about nature smells that, that might also be leading to some of these benefits. Yeah. I'm also wondering if there's differentiation and different focus on short-term and long-term effects or like cumulative effects of spending time in nature because like the study that you did, it was a shorter term. It was, you know, a longer walk. But right. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think, for example, like the study we did in Toronto, I think those are cumulative effects, right? Uh, I mean, we're assuming, we don't know exactly how long people live in every neighborhood, um, but presumably the longer you've lived there, the more either positive benefits you've got or negative benefits. Logistically, we've restricted these laboratory studies to just these short interactions, but it's something that we've kind of been interested in doing is can we, can we do week-long studies or if we collaborated with like Outward Bound or something like that, where they're sending people out in nature for like a month at a time, you know, would we see some differential effects? Yeah. Like, um, I was wondering about when the nature exposure is like at the same time as whatever the task someone is trying to do too, like what uh, the effect would be, because they're like immersing themselves and then coming back. Yeah. Right? I was wondering if like if the scene outside the window, say like in this, this housing study. Like, I was wondering what effect that would have to do. Yeah. So there have been some study, studies that people have done in workplaces. So a view of nature is beneficial to work performance. An LCD screen where nature is kind of flipping over also has some benefits, but not as good as the, the view of nature out the window. We tried to do an experimental study. We collaborated with Herman Miller that makes, like, office furniture. <laughs> and... Uh, we created these cubicles where we flashed kind of nature slides while people were doing these hard cognitive tasks. We didn't see any benefit. It was only when we stopped and let people just interact with the nature, just view the nature, not to do the work, that we saw the benefit. So it might be that, you know, kind of like what you were saying before, if you're, if you're, if you're using directed attention and you can't actually be immersed in the environment, maybe you don't get the benefits. But if you've got the nature view out the window, and from day to day, you can pause and look out. Maybe then you get you get the benefit. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll um, I'll stop there and just um, so so the other thing too is you know we can do the same kind of scrambling with colors. And then what about just the thought of nature? So maybe it doesn't have to do with these low level perceptual properties. Maybe if we just prime people with nature thoughts, you know, would we get um, similar kind of benefits? So we're looking into into this as well. Um, so just to conclude, I'll skip over the eye tracking thing. Um, 
So we're finding significant impacts or benefits of interacting with nature on health and well-being. Um, brief interactions with nature can produce significant benefits in, in memory and attention. Um, Daniel Burnham, the, the famous landscape ar architect in Chicago, said, make no little plans. You know, and we're not making little plans. You know, we, we really want to try to find features of the physical environment that can have psychological benefits so that we can design the physical environment in ways to sort of optimize um, human psychological functioning. And that's uh, what a lot of lab has been focused on now. So thanks so much for your uh, attention and just a, a thank you to all my collaborators on this work and uh, it was, this was fun. Yeah, maybe. Child.